Yay. <laughs> Well, we are just thrilled to have you all, and I think we're going to dive in. Jessica, take it away. Yeah, let's go. Again, so thrilled you're all here. I'm going to share my screen. Let's make sure this is working. Okay. Oop. You guys all see the slide? Okay. So again, welcome. This is an amazing collaborative full of diverse scientists and educators, and we're just so thrilled to be here. Um, so I'll have everyone introduce, like reintroduce themselves briefly in a second. Um, but just to give you a quick overview of the year, I mean, the goals are really to learn and practice pedagogical techniques that really push your teaching forward and align with the next generation science standards. And based on my own experience and knowledge, I think, you know, there's always more to learn and we're going to try to bring the most cutting edge new research based resources to you to support that work. We also really want to support integrative education, right? So integrating science with other subjects, not seeing science as something separate or apart from the other work that you're doing with your students day in and day out. We want to make sure that science is a part of that and connected to it. And we really want to support you throughout the year to design and implement new a new instructional unit about your watersheds and local east ecosystems that is really tailored for your students that meets the needs and interests of you and your students. So this is really about small group and one to one support for doing that kind of development throughout the year. And again, you have a really diverse team of scientists and educators to do that with. So I'll just briefly reintroduce myself. My name is Jessica Bean. I work at UC Berkeley. I run a project called Understanding Global Change. As I mentioned, um, a lot of my formal education is actually in biological and geological sciences. Um, but I've been working in education for oh, like over 10 years now, <laughs> longer than that. I guess it'd be more like 15 in terms of the teaching and everything I was doing. Um, I've run major programs for districts, um, both in Northern California and beyond to support integration of science education and specifically climate education into curriculum. Um, and this is actually my third year working with MCOE to support um, NOAA workshops and professional development. Um, so again, I'm really thrilled to be here. So much of what all of you said earlier really resonates with me about why I do this work. And it's about awareness and connecting and, you know, supporting students um, to, to feel more confident and, and understand the world around them in a meaningful way. And so I'm just so thrilled to be here and with this amazing team. So I'll pass it over to Jenny and then we'll have Sagit introduce herself. And then Michelle, if you wanna say anything more, go ahead. But I'll pass it to Jenny now. Hi, I'm Jenny. And this is my second year working with MCOE on the NOAA grant. Um, Previously, I worked for uh, the Conservation Corps and um, spent several years um, running or, or just supporting schools in, um, in getting school gardens up and running, doing waste audits and recycling and composting programs and rainwater catchment systems and, um, and doing like after school programs where kids were doing um, you know, litter abatement and learning about just being stewards of their um, school. I, I supported um, my kids elementary school for three years with a, a NOAA grant, the Ocean Guardian School Grant, where I wrote the grant each year and we were able to support our school garden and a garden teacher and um, did a lot of really cool, fun um, conservation and stewardship projects at that campus through that grant, which it's, I love sharing that grant with teachers. Um, and, and then I more recently I've been, um, I, I mean, I've spent my whole career teaching environmental education as, you know, an educator myself at the Point Bonita YMCA. And then more recently, I was the education director at Nature Bridge, which is an environmental, a residential environmental um, school. Uh, in the Marin Headlands. So um, yeah, I just have a long career of doing a lot of project-based learning in environmental education and conservation and love supporting teachers in, um, in integrating that into the science and other subjects that they're teaching in schools. Yeah. 
Uh, we should, Sagi? Okay. Ah, before the dog. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sagit Betzer, and uh, my background is mechanical engineering and chemistry. And uh, before coming to the education field, um, I was uh, for more than I think like, I was like 15 years in the world of uh, design. So I led the design of uh, products, of games, of uh, the, like different things from like desktop stuff to uh, uh, medical devices, and always thinking about um, how to make things that work well with what the needs are and being playful and culturally responsive and then bringing and then when I moved uh, to the world of education I'm bringing these expertise to really support you in realization of your visions and your ideas and and supporting your product which is your units your lessons based on everything that you have in a very iterative playful way. Awesome. Michelle, do you want to say any other words about yourself? No, I'm good. Thank you so much. Just ready to get started. All right. And then last but not least, we have our um, amazing partner, Megan Isidore from the River Otter Ecology Project. So she has been the one providing a lot of the data and information that we can use as part of our learning experiences about the river otters and our local watersheds. And so those of you who are on the boat met her, um, but I think almost everyone here has worked with her before. And so we're really excited to have her back this year to support this work. And again, as I mentioned, our goal is really to be using the most uh, research informed practices um, that are available right now that have been, um, uh, again, developed uh, really over the last 20, 30 years to help us understand how people learn. Um, so those include next-gen storylines out of Northwestern and ambitious science teaching out of University of Washington. Um, so you'll recognize this is the text that we'll be using again this year. And I think everyone has, or should have been asked if they have a copy, is that correct, Michelle? Um, if you do not have a copy of this, please send me a, a chat and I'll make sure you get a copy ASAP. Yeah. So we'll make sure that you have that as a resource that you'll be using this year. Because again, we want to make sure that we are being responsive to the standards that you need to hit at your grade level based on the next generation science standards and other California state standards. Um, and we want to be three dimensional in our thinking. So just a quick review of three dimensions that there are these science and engineering practices, ways in which people can engage as as scientists and engineers um, and, and use the, those uh, practices in their everyday learning and applying big cross-cutting concepts that are common across all sciences to really understanding the disciplinary core ideas or the core content, right, that we're teaching. Um, so the orange is the content, right, the understanding physical or biological components of an ecosystem. But really, it's about putting all three of these dimensions together and making sure that students can actually use that knowledge in a meaningful way. And again, we want to make sure that this is tailored for your students at your grade level this year. So today we are going to do a debrief from our sailing adventure, or if you were not there, you're going to use some of your prior knowledge from your past learning experiences to engage in a modeling activity. You'll notice that I switched between two different colored slides, blue slides, which indicate that we're in learner mode. So we want you to go through the activity and the resource as learners. You can use your full adult knowledge. You don't have to pretend to be third graders or anything like that, but you. But the ex expectation is that you engage as a learner and we don't expect you to know everything. Um, no one here knows everything. <laughs> so we just want you to feel comfortable in that space. Um, and then in the yellow slides are sort of when we return to more teacher mode. So when we're reflecting on our practice and we're thinking about how we're gonna plan uh, for this year and the kind of work that we're going to do with our students. And so again, we don't expect you to be familiar necessarily with all of what we're talking about, but it's so it just so the yellow slides can indicate to you sort of how we're thinking about the work that we're doing in that moment. Um, so we're going to transition from our uh, modeling activity then into a review and or an introduction to ambitious science teaching and phenomena if you've not used the, that resource or that technique before. Um, and then we're going to be sharing, um, an, uh, we're going to be asking you to be sharing uh, parts of your curriculum to help us plan with you for the next coming, for the coming year. So we'll talk a little bit more about the logistics of that and sort of the timeline for what we're thinking about how that will play out. 
Um, anything I've forgotten, Sagit, before I hand it off to you for the next slides? All right, so take it away, Sagit. <laughs> okay, beautiful pictures of a very beautiful day. And yeah, we sailed over the bay. We even went below the Golden Gate Bridge first time for me. Um, and so many activities and things. Um, let's move to the next slide. And before I'll just go, before I go and just say what to re remind ourselves and also to other people of what happened there, uh, for the people who were there, I'm curious, what do you think, what kind of uh, NGSS practices we used that day on the boat? Who, whoever wants to, to say something, just to un unmute yourself and, and share. We did number three, planning and carrying out investigations when we dropped the manta ray uh, collector off the uh -oh. side of the boat. Yeah, oh, this was fun. <laughs> and what were you what were you investigating? Just for those people who weren't there. Sure, uh, my and understanding was it was just catching the tip of the water, or just the the surface of the water, and trying to collect in a net um, debris. And then later that debris, I believe, was we parsed through it to see maybe how much plastic or the percentage of plastic, the amount of plastic that was in that debris. Yes. Thank you, Ryan. Any other practices that we had there doing? I think we were asking a lot of questions and defining problems. Can you share more? One, one example? Um, I think especially during the activity around looking at the different types of um, plastics mm -hmm. and other garbage that you might find in the environment and figuring out how long uh, it would take for that stuff to break down and why and um, um, just kind of, you know, asking more questions about the bio, you know, biodegradable plastics or, um, or uh, compostable plastics and regular plastics. So, yes. And then the problems that go with each. Great. Thanks, Jenny. We also did number four and number four. Well, number four, and number five, when we were taking the salinity testing, with using the um, the equipment for looking at bay water versus creek water versus um, uh, the open ocean water. True. So we, yeah, we check different kinds of uh, waters to see um, what's the, the differences between. Yeah. Anything else that we used here? We used um, number seven when we were sorting the plastics into um, when, how long we thought they would take to break down and uh, discussing and arguing, arguing in our groups as to um, which a year span they should go into. Yeah, a lot of surprises there. <laughs> we had some hypothesis and really, sometimes we're really off. <laughs> Anything else? Did we engage in number two in any way or what left eight? We talked about everyone had a sheet uh, and was we were talking about developing and using models, but I don't think we were able to do much, do a lot with that because we were too excited about everything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Okay, great. I think we uh, can move to the next slide, which it's 
actually what we just like talked about is we started with a, a driving question that Megan talked with us about what determines where river orders live. And we specifically talked about, let's think throughout the day about food web, about the state of the bay and our own local watershed and how they're all connected. We talked a lot about connections and thinking about connections. And we had the uh, document with uh, start to start creating models and putting our, our things on paper, our questions, but also the, these connections that we talk about. And we did it also through three stations, as just shared now. We had the plankton one, which looked at the plankton in the in the water and the different the two different kinds, the water quality and, and the microplastics with this net Monterey <laughs> that collected it. And yeah, and we asked, of course, to record further questions that we have because Elwood's learning just open up a lot of uh, continuing questions. And I think we'll. Today, we will do something with all of these things and the uh, things that we already did before and all our knowledge from before. Wonderful. Thank you, Sigi, for reminding us of what the what the trip um, involved and what we were able to engage in. Um, and just as a reminder, because we have um, some people who are new, that we really did use the river otters as an anchoring phenomenon. And we'll talk about a little bit more what that means, but that we sort of tried to anchor our thinking around all the different things we were seeing that day and bringing it back to how is this connected to our otters and where they live. Uh, and just to remind you that Megan showed you a, a, a data set a, or a range map that was developed by um, Fish and Wildlife back in 1995 that showed where otter, river otters were known to live in Northern California. But the reality is that in recent days, especially since the late 80s and 90s into the 2000s, we've been seeing a lot more observations um, in these areas that were not included in this original otter range, so represented by these red stars here. So I'm just going to show, for some of you, you who have not seen river otter videos before, I'm just going to share a couple with you. If they'll play, there it goes. Just so you get a sense of these little guys and what they look like and how they move. This is a video that was taken out in Point Reyes. There they all go back to the water. Could you hear the sound for that? Or did you, could you not hear it? No sound. Okay, let me do a new share with the sound. Okay. Okay. So the sex one, you should be able to hear the sound on then. And this is in the Contra Costa Canal. So again, these are some of the observations that were starting to be made. This is a 
a shot from someone in Sausalito who had a, an otter on their boat. There were these reports showing up of otters in Lake Merritt in the middle of Oakland. And in San Francisco, out near the Sutro Baths, they named him Sutro Sam. <laughs> so this was in 2013. Um, and just other reports of that we're seeing more otters. They're making a comeback. This was 2015. And Megan also shared a data set with you that's based on her otter spotter citizen science uh, observations um, that shows all of these yellow dots are observations of live otters that have been reported um, by citizen scientists or community scientists um, in Northern California, which is very exciting. So using that information, again, and your prior knowledge and your experience on the Bay, we'd like to engage you in an activity to, again, model your ideas of what, you're know, what you know and what you're thinking um, based on, again, your, your prior knowledge and what you've learned so far. So um, you're gonna be given this modeling template, which you were shown um, uh, on the boat. Um, it's sort of this ocean to mountain scene. You can decide if this is the bay or the ocean, depending on what you want it to be. Uh, you can write any questions you have, record them um, on this model. Uh, and you're gonna be working in groups on, on a Jamboard page. So each group is gonna have their own page to construct their models. And I just want to point out really quickly that you can zoom in and out and make a lot more space for yourself on the Jamboard um, and make it a lot bigger so that you can uh, have space for all of your ideas. So just some more instructions. You're going to have 10 minutes to do this work in, in, a, in pairs or in groups of three because of the number of people we have here today. Um, and we just want you to create a model that explains what you know about where otters live and why they might have returned to the Bay Area. So think about how our rivers and creeks are connected to the ocean and the bay, right? That was a lot of what we thought about on the boat is thinking about those, those connections and those conditions um, in the bay and, and otherwise and how that might affect where otters live. So again, use what you learned on the boat and all your prior knowledge and experience. There are lots of ways to express your thinking and words, diagrams, arrows, no wrong answers. And again, as always, the idea is that we can improve our models over time as we learn more. So this is just a way to get some ideas out on the Jamboard and reflect on the learning experience that we had on the boat and also maybe share some, again, our prior knowledge and our prior experience with, um, with this or similar topics. So I'm going to put this uh, tiny URL in the chat so you can click on that. So if everyone could click there and make sure they can get into that Jamboard really quickly. And I can do the breakout rooms. I've got it ready to go when you're ready. Oh, okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, go ahead, go ahead and open the breakout room. So again, we're gonna give you 10 minutes. So at 427, we're gonna come back together um, with our models to, to, uh, to share and discuss. Sandra, did you do you need support? You're and muted. Then... Are you there? Oh, there she goes. Okay. I think she's in there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Good job. This is going great. Is it okay? Okay. Yeah, I think I'm so. Check in. Yeah, I think it's good. I think it's good. We're, we're behind, but like, I, I think it's better that they have time to talk and be together and yes. not so. rush them through everything. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, it looks like Megan and Sigi. Okay. I think that's fine. That's great. Thank you for doing the breakout rooms. <laughs> Want me to move anybody around? No, I think it's, it's great. I think they'll be, they'll be good. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to check on Sagit and Megan really quickly and make sure they're doing okay.
Okay. How'd that go? It's fun. Good. All right. Welcome back. How'd that go? Great. Get some ideas out onto the Jamboard. It looks like you did. So let me share my screen really quickly. Okay. You guys see my slide? Does it look okay? Yep. Okay, great. So um, if you just want to take a minute and look at the other uh, models in the, in the deck, um, just to get a sense of what people created. If we had more time, we would obviously do this gallery walk in a more structured way with some discussion and feedback. But for now, let's just take a look at what we have. So group one and group two. Wow, lots of ideas. Awesome. Very cool. All right, see a key over here. Again, feel free to just flip through for yourself. Take a quick look. See if there are any particular themes, things you have in common with other models that you're viewing. Okay. All right, so now I just wanna open it up to you. What are some of the things that you felt we definitely needed to include in those models? And did you see them in, in other groups? So feel free to just unmute yourself and I'll take notes as you talk. Um, but what are some of those really big ideas that we felt were super important to include in those models? The path that the river otters uh, travel. Say more about that. What do you mean by the path? Um, how they travel. How, okay. From place to place. Okay. Awesome. Anyone else talk about that a bit in thinking about where they, how they moved in your model? We included that they travel over large areas of land as well as living along water paths. And we were wondering how much they've been affected by the fires and their habitats. Great question. So again, we can, we can record any questions we have, right? And there was a place on your Jamboard and some of you may have used that to record some of the, um, some of these ideas. Awesome. Any other questions or components and ideas that you would want to add to your to these models? It's really important to include. But especially this year, not just the fires, but the lack of rain, lack of um and the drought. Severe drought. Yeah. Yep. How how that affects um where they um live or where they awesome any anyone else make any observations or thoughts about water and drought include anything like that on your on your models no but we forgot to add about ocean acidification and if that is changing their um habitats or or choice feeding areas, I guess. Yeah, we were we were talking about the temperature of the water and if it's changed is temp is the temperature of the water um, forcing them to to move to new areas. Awesome. Yeah, or not awesome for them, but like good idea, like a, a useful thought in terms of the, the again, the things that we talked about on the boat, right, the chemistry and the temperature of the water. Thank you. Anything else? Anyone want to build on these ideas? I like, all... Go ahead. I liked group four's arrow running off uh, from the farms down into the water and their key with pollution. Oh, that was right. something that we discussed that as well of trying to figure out if that's caused any problems or if that's cleaned up recently. Great question. So relating this back to human activities. Um, and pollution and water quality. Did anyone else make any other human 
activity connections? If there's been more like habitat restoration around the San Francisco Bay in the past 20 years and cleaning, uh, just kind of general cleaning of the bay, just having a healthier bay. Awesome. Does anyone want to expand on that idea of healthier? What do we mean by healthier? Um, so healthier meaning, uh, 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 native plants, right? Um, okay, native plants. Does anyone agree? And removal of uh, invasive, species. invasive species. Okay, awesome. Any other any other thoughts, ideas? Again, I'm not saying if I agree or disagree with these, but I really like that you're coming up with a lot of different thoughts and connections. I, I think this is great. Any, any others that we want to add to this list that were in your models that things we would want to explore or investigate? More education and awareness around um, toxins going into the bay so around runoff and you know all the all the flows to the bay stenciling that's happened and just the education and awareness around not uh dumping oil and um <laughs> trash in the bay great okay great awesome so we're going to leave this here and we're going to come back to these. We can come back to this list, right? We can build on it and create more connections over time as we learn more about the otters and our bay, right? So this is sort of just our initial list of what are the big things that we want to be thinking about and connecting to. Um, so I'm going to sort of switch modes now for the last like 20 minutes of our time together. But thank you all for your participation and your model building and your discussion. That was that was awesome. So really like this activity and this way of, again, sort of launching an investigation is really about making connections. Right. And thinking about how there are so many topics we can connect to understanding and thinking about our river otters, um, even if that's just where we start. Right. Is just with with thinking about river otters. And I'll just say very briefly, oh, I don't know why those things are there, but um, the point is uh, that there was a tool that I was briefly introduced to you on the boat, which is the Understanding Global Change Framework, which is which I developed at UC Berkeley and is all about really connecting the dots, right? Going from information, little bits of information about like the water cycle and pollution and invasive species and you know other things that can affect the ecosystem, habitat restoration, and really connecting the dots and thinking about how does that explain the world around us and what we see and what we observe, what we can measure and really how do we build knowledge using that all those different perspectives and bits of information and so that's really what this understanding global change resource is about which we're not going to have time to dive into today but next time we'll spend a little more time with the framework unpacking it and thinking more about these types of connections and so the whole idea is that these types of activities, modeling activities and focusing on a particular phenomenon um, really help to create those shifts that are required for implementation of the NGSS sort of as it was designed based on lots of research, like again, decades of research and understanding about how people learn. So the first really big shift that we're trying to get at is we're trying to get away from just learning facts about, you know, specifically like, okay, how much has this temperature changed or how much has the pH changed in the bay? So really figuring out how does that inform our models and our understanding and our explanations again, of what's happening in the ecosystem around us. So really moving away from just discrete facts to explanatory knowledge. So making connections, describing relationships and processes to explain complex phenomena, like the return of our river otters, right? That's actually, you'll hear from Megan over the course of the year, there's no one thing that we can point to that explains exactly why and how they've returned, but it's, pro it's a constellation of things um, that we can be thinking about that will explain 
how their, their geographic range has changed. Um, and the shift, the second shift that we really want to engage in and, 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 and uh, use in moving forward is to make sure that all students are engaging in scientific thinking, right? They're using those science engineering practices and they're going from just learning about science, thinking about science as a body of existing knowledge, right? Oh, we already know this, science tells us this, to really knowing how science works and how we figure things out. Right in the world. And that's very different, like, because science is both a body of knowledge and a process. And we want to make sure that students really understand what that process is and how to figure things out using scientific practices. Um, and we can do that through phenomena driven instruction, which I'll explain more a little bit more about what phenomena are in a second. And again, really shifting from rote to meaningful use of the practices and those big cross-cutting concepts that are relevant across all sciences and, and beyond, really. Um, but that they're really focusing less on sort of like the steps of a process to really understanding like what they're doing and why. Um, and how does it help them achieve their scientific goals, which is, you know, should be to explain something or understand something. So again, these are three really big shifts that we're gonna be working towards throughout the year in the new materials that we'll be co-designing together. Um, and again, it's not something that happens overnight um, as, we, as we all know. So uh, we'll be keeping these in mind as we move forward over the next months. And if, you sort, if I sort of just try to summarize the teaching practices that are in ambitious science teaching in one slide, you can sort of think of them as student discourse or discussion practices, and also really focusing on these explanatory modeling activities. So giving students a chance to you know, really do the thinking for themselves, showing what they know, making it public, right? Not just in your head or on a test that no one else sees. Because when you share ideas, they can also become resources for others, right? You can, I mean, even in the, the short discussion that we had where we made the list of, you know, what was in your model? What would you want there, right? Like you were building off of each other's thoughts and ideas. Um, and it also helps you as the educator realize who's silent, right? Who's participating and who is not um, and why might that be? Um, and it really, again, provides that opportunity to use scientific ideas and language, not just learn about them, but use them. Okay, so again, we used our river otters as our anchoring phenomenon. So I've used that phrase a few times now, anchoring phenomenon, and I just wanna give you the definition from ambitious science teaching of what that is. So it's a puzzling event or process whose full explanation requires a wide range of science ideas to be coordinated with one another and with evidence. So an anchoring phenomenon, again, like our river otters, is not something that we can just explain or understand fully within maybe an hour or two of instruction, right? But it's something that you're going to need some time to unpack and understand and use a lot of different science ideas um, to explain. And hopefully you're doing that with evidence, with data, with information, right, to really be able to explain, um, explain a complex phenomenon. So, and then our role as educators really becomes, um, you know, somewhat different than we would think of, and certainly in, in the way that I was taught and the way I taught at the beginning of my career, like where I thought I was more in transmit mode and telling people information, but really my goal is now to, is to create opportunities every day for students to make sense of things, for that student sense making for themselves, right? To explain things, use data, use evidence, connect ideas. Um, rather than just providing information um, for students to, uh, to know or learn in some way. But really, we're trying to shift to, to sense making. And why is that? Because we know that students learn best. They actually can like use the information that, that they are gathering if content is embedded or contextualized in a problem or an event or a process, right? Like having it be something local, right? It's otters in the Bay Area, it's in their backyard. Um, and also if the content is connected to their lives or their interests in some way, they're, they're more likely to be invested. And the other idea is that, you know, we should be revisiting the phenomenon several times, right? As we increase our depth of understanding over the course of a unit. So looking at at least like two weeks of instruction, how do we connect different ideas together over, a, you know, a couple weeks of instruction to explain what we're, what we're seeing, what's happening. Um, and really that students don't have to have the right answer the first time, right? The idea is that they should be able to revise 
their ideas over time as they learn more, as they get new information, as they receive feedback from you as their, their teacher and from others. Um, and so that creates a safe space for them to really show what they know and not just expect to be right the first time, right? <laughs> um, because we all know that you know, assessment is very different from evaluation. Um, and we want students, we want there to be formative evaluation like that modeling activity that doesn't seem scary, doesn't seem intimidating, but it really does help us understand what students are thinking and what they know. Okay, so I'm talking at you a lot, I'm almost done, but I just wanna give you a little more context for phenomena and this idea that we can have phenomena at every grade level, right? And in the work that we're doing this coming year, we're not asking that you necessarily use the river otters as your phenomenon in your classroom. It could be any phenomenon related to watersheds um, and your science curriculum. So here are just some examples, again, from ambitious science teaching of how phenomena have been used to explore, you know, physics, chemistry, biology. So in kindergarten, how can someone little push someone big off of the end of a slide? So students, I've seen the results from this work and students made models understanding those basic physics, right? Of what it means to go down a slide um, and really cool uh, insights into how students think about you know, motion and, um, and, and the, that physics. Um, so fifth grade, why are solar eclipses predictable and so rare? So think about all of the things you can teach about the solar system and um, you know, the tides and like so many things that we could be connecting back to thinking about solar eclipses and why they're predictable and rare, especially full, you know, complete solar eclipses. Uh, and then finally, all the way up to things like AP chemistry, right? Like, where does the heat go when I pour out my coffee? Um, lots of connections you can make to like heat and energy budget of the earth and ocean circulation and, you know, lots of lots of opportunities there to connect to um, this, you know, pretty simple phenomenon, but to other like really big earth system processes around heat and heat capacity and storage. Okay, so again, we want to support you in developing your own phenomena, okay, that are right for you and your classroom. And so the two most common types of phenomena are sort of a change over time. So before, during, and after. So our otter phenomenon is actually kind of a perfect example of that, right? Like something has changed over time and the otters have returned to the Bay Area. And we're trying to explain what's happened. The other type of phenomena is often sort of a compare contrast, like two different things. Like we have two different types of volcanoes. Um, Mount St. Helens is a very explosive volcano, but Mauna Loa in Hawaii um, is not as explosive and has more of these lava flows. So what is the difference? Why are those differences happening? Um, and again, another example of this before, during, after over time would be like understanding the growth of a tree over time from a seed um, into a tree. Um, so again, these don't have to be super like, again, complex phenomena in the sense it's, it's something that you've never thought about before, you've never taught, but the idea is that you're anchoring the learning around these particular events and processes and coming back to it and allowing students to construct models that show their thinking. So I'm just going to introduce very quickly to you that we have this criteria checklist um, to help you think about your phenomena. So again, is this phenomenon observable, right? Is it something that students can look at either like with their, just with their eyes or with data sets? Um, it could happen over a long or short period of time, but there has to be some sort of way to interact with the phenomenon, right? You need like an image or a data set or a video. And does this phenomenon happen in a particular place, right? We wanna contextualize it. Hopefully it's something that's fairly local, especially for younger students. So it's something they can directly connect to, but it could be something that happens over a large geographic region. Um, is it, does it have the potential to be explored in a variety of engaging ways? Again, pictures, videos, data sets, different types of investigations, outdoor experiences. Um, you know, again, that's the creative work we wanna do this year is figure out how are the, what are the creative ways we can connect learning in different environments and different resources back to your phenomenon. And then again, is it gonna be interesting? Is it gonna motivate students and sustain their interest? And could it connect to students' prior knowledge and out of school experiences? So again, any, any connections we can make to students to make this more meaningful um, are ideal. So again, you don't have to necessarily hit all of these, but these are the criteria that you wanna be looking for as you think about selecting a phenomenon. 
So when we come back together next time at the beginning, we're going to do an activity where we're going to look at different like phenomena, different ideas that might be phenomena. And you're going to do a sort where you're going to be discussing like, is this a phenomenon or how do I make this into a more compelling phenomenon? And I found this is the only way you can really learn how to do this is by practicing and using lots of examples. And so we're going to do that next time as a group, which I'm excited about. So we'll be doing another Jamboard group activity. And so now just in closing, because I know we're almost out of time and I want to honor your time, <laughs> um, just to give you a sense of the, our timeline for the whole year. So when we meet again in December, we're going to be working on thinking about our phenomena and our standards and um, also the outdoor and schoolyard project ideas that we have that might, you know, connect to new and existing curriculum that we're working on. In January, we're gonna develop example models. So think of the otter model that you made today, but you're gonna be making one for your unit, whatever it is. Like, what are the big ideas that you're gonna want students to connect as they learn over time? Um, so sort of that example model, and then thinking about the existing resources and materials you have that you can use in your unit. Uh, and again, when I say unit, I'm really talking about like around two weeks of instruction, could be more, um, but we really want to aim for at least sort of like two weeks of, of, you know, coming back to an idea and students refining their thinking. Um, so that could be, you know, at least around 10 hours of, of, uh, of class time total. Um, so then we're going to, in February, we're really going to start working on you, with you um, on your uh, unit scope and sequence to really help with that development. And in March, you know, working on refining those and connecting the units to outdoor project plans. And we're really hoping that in, in April and May, we will be ready to be implementing the unit, right? That we'll have some time um, to be doing that. And then reporting back to the team in May and June about how to go, what happened? Like, how do we make this better? How do we support you? Um, Cause again, this really should be small group and one-to-one -one support this year so that we know where you are and you have the support that you need to, to implement this year and share um, a phenomenon based unit about your watershed with your students. Um, that being said, like, we know you have existing curricula, you have existing materials that you have to cover, right, in the spring. So we want to integrate this work with that, right? This is not separate from that, but we want to see what it is that you want to teach and what you plan to teach in the spring and make sure that this works with that. That's our goal, um, is that it all is coordinated and integrated and works together. So I already mentioned this, but again, you don't have to use the otters as your phenomenon. Think about something you're excited about um, and be patient with yourself because like selecting the right phenomenon can be difficult. It can take a little bit of time. But again, we're here to help you with that process. Okay, so in the last five minutes, I'm gonna ask you, uh, or I'm gonna share with you just a plan so that we can learn more about your classrooms. Because for us to help you in this way, we need to know more about what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, uh, in your classroom. So we would like you to share your spring semester teaching materials that you'd like us to work on with you. So even materials that might not seem relevant, maybe it's history, social studies, maybe it's um, math curriculum, whatever it is, we would love to see what you're doing in spring that you think you could, you would be interested in integrating with this work around the watersheds. So I emailed each of you a link to a private folder so you can upload your materials. It's just shared with the, with the leadership team. Um, and so you can share any of those, any and all of those materials into that folder. Um, and this will really allow us to start planning how we can support you in the best way over the course of the year. Because we, again, we really want this to be personalized and specific to your needs. Did everyone receive a link, an email to a folder? Or did at least some of you see a link to a folder? Okay, I see some nods. Okay, awesome, great. Okay, so again, that is only shared with our leadership team on the project, no one else. So that is your own private folder. Okay, so class again, just to think about it, class materials would be useful. Any class syllabus or outline of topics for the year, right, to give us the big picture. Um, existing unit plans, especially ones you'd like to enhance for this year or, or, or um, alter. Um, so any information about outdoor or schoolyard projects that you do or want to do this year. 
any materials provided by your school or district that you've not, even if you haven't used them yet, textbooks, curricula programs, find out if you can give us access so that we can see what has been provided to you and how we can use that and leverage that for this work. So uh, Sagit and I, we, we were thinking about these examples. So like if one teacher has a science curriculum that's provided by the district, but also wants to add a schoolyard investigation, like share with us that science curriculum and those ideas for that schoolyard investigation. Um, if you have two standards that you really wanna hit, but one's NGSS and one's social studies and history, like share those with us. We wanna see how we can make those connections and, and build that, um, that unit with you. Um, maybe you have your own unit developed, but you just want to enhance it with some more data and more outdoor experiences, or maybe you're super interested this year in monarch butterflies because you just heard the awesome NPR report that came out a couple days ago and you want to study monarchs this year with your students. Um, so let us help you connect to those ideas and those resources and those materials that you have already. Okay, Sagi, anyone else want to jump in, say any more about that? Um, so for next time, so next time we will definitely all be together as a group is December 16th, so before the holidays. So we would love for you to read chapters one and two in Ambitious Science Teaching. It's a pretty accessible read, um, and this will just get you more into, you know, some of you have read this before, but this will just remind you of the big ideas um, in Ambitious Science Teaching. We would really appreciate it if you could upload materials before December 1, before we have our office hours, because then that will help us make the most of that office hour that's on December 1 from 3.30 to 4.30. Um, so that we really can have, again, those meaningful one-to-one -one and small group discussions to help you tailor this program to your needs. Um, and just start thinking about potential phenomena. Again, you don't have to be tied to any particular idea, but if you have ideas and you're like, yes, monarch butterflies or whatever it is, like bring that idea next time and we'll keep working on it together. Um, and then just finally, we do have a few more spots available in the group. So if you have a colleague at your school who you think would be great to partner on this work, please, please ask them to, um, to sign up, either they can email us or, um, and then and or sign up directly um, and bring them next time or bring them to office hour, <laughs> um, whatever works for, for their schedule. So um, any other thoughts, comments, questions from either the team or um, just to yeah. just Go to ahead. add, I want to I want to say something that you don't have to choose a phenomena. You can say yeah. I just interested in that help. And then we can work together if this is what you want to work together and figure out how to make a phenomenon out of it. Yeah. Yep. Just spend a few minutes. Give it a start. Or if something pops out at you again while you're reading the news, um, take note of that. We'd love to hear from about that next time. So again, you're yeah, as Sigit said, you're in no way tied to doing uh, or selecting a phenomenon for next time, but start thinking of ideas. All right, well, I hope that was helpful and gives you a sort of a lay of the land and what we're planning this year and how we want to support your work moving forward. Please feel free to, you know, I'll stay on if there are any questions, but also feel free to reach out by email. Um, you should all have my email now that I've sent you links to the folders and on some of the uh, other information about the program. All right, well, it's 501. Have a so, good night. Yeah, have a great night. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.